I can't tell you how good it is to be in the family of God this morning. Man, we go through stuff in our lives, and uh, it's, it's just good to be together. Is there anything more important than grace? Where would I be? Where would we be without the grace of God? Amen? Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. We just sit down and go to worship after that. That's the message. It's grace. And, and Christianity is about grace. Grace is about the free gift of forgiveness. That's grace. Grace is about the gift of eternal life with Jesus, with our loved ones. That's grace. But lots of Christians, including myself, don't understand grace. It seems so simple, yet it's so broad. It, it's so big. It, it's so hard to comprehend grace. But without an understanding of grace, without an awareness of grace, it's going to be very difficult to live a life of a peace that surpasses all understanding, which is what we've been talking about lately. It, it, yet, yet when you understand it, when you comprehend it, that's when we can have peace even in the storms of life. And how many of you know, oh, there's storms of life. But we need to understand grace. There's all kinds of definitions of grace. I don't know the statistic. I think there's like over 100 verses in the Bible on grace. It's very important. But one definition of grace is this. I chose this one. Two words. Unmerited favor. That's what grace is. Unmerited. We didn't deserve it. We don't, des we don't get what we deserve, do we? But grace is unmerited. We don't deserve it. And it's a favor from God. Grace is a favor from from God, I'm dating myself, but we used to sing in the 70s this great song, he paid a debt I did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Great song. Before we go any further, I want to have somebody come and share a testimony of grace in her life. She's a little nervous, so let's, let's support her through this and help her through it. But it's an amazing story, and I want you to hear this as we begin this series on grace. Lynn, Lynn Wooten, you didn't disappear. Oh, yeah, you're here. That's grace in itself. <laughs> hey, uh, Brad, Brad, you want to get this up there? We're going to put her on the mic. Oh, I'm so glad you showed up, Lynn. We weren't sure. We're glad to grab the Kleenex. I'm with you there. Okay. <laughs> the lights are so bright, I can barely see anyone, and that's a good thing. <laughs> good morning, everyone. My name is Carolyn Wooten, but everybody calls me Lynn. I was born in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I'm the middle child. I have two brothers. The worshiping in me up here is tripping me out of it. It's okay. I have a different father than my two brothers, and I never met my real father. When I was five, my mother and the only dad I knew got a divorce. My mother was a drinker. When I was seven, we moved from a nice house to an apartment in Chicago over a hardware store with a bar across the street. I had a speech problem in Michigan, and it got a lot worse when I got here. My mother frequented the bar across the street all the time. She would sometimes come home with some bar men drunk. they go to her room and do what they did. Some of them would beat her up. And then some of them would come and sexually abuse me. The first time it happened, I saw my brother, Earl. He was standing at the door, and I was asking him to help me, but he was just scared, and he stood there until a man chased him away. And he told me not to tell mama because 
if I did, he would get in trouble for not helping me. So I didn't tell her. So I was about 10 years old. And when I told her, she told me I was lying, I was fast, I was everything negative you can think of. And I told her, no, my Earl saw it. When she asked Earl, he told her, Mama Leah's just lying. So she beat me. So about a month or so later, my brother began to abuse me. Uh, I, I started carrying knives with me all the time to protect myself. And um, I cut my brother really bad on the arm one night. My mother was drinking, so when he, she saw the cut, he told her he got in a fight with some kids at school, and that's how it happened. I never told my mother what my brother did to me because I figured if she beat me for the bar, man, she'd kill me about her son. And after that, my brother started to protect me. After I cut him, he would help me. We used to get evicted all the time and stay with my aunt and my uncle and their nine kids. My brother joined the army. My mother continued to drink, me and my youngest brother. Uh, we moved to the projects on 39th Street. I was a teenager by this time and I was going to high school and I didn't want to switch schools. And she refused to give me bus fare or lunch money, anything. So I would walk to and from school 30 blocks each way. 68th and Stewart from 39th Street till I got a job cleaning the ladies' house, so that would be my lunch and my bus fare. And my mother met a guy, a regular guy, that she kind of liked at the bar, so they got drunk together and they got married. After they got married, we moved to his house from the projects. She told me she was marrying him for security. Well, he told her he didn't want her to drink anymore. And when she did, he would be very belligerent towards her, and sometimes he would hit her. So I tried to protect my mom. When he hit her, I'd hit him. I hit him hard and kicked him and he fell to the floor one day and I told him if he hit my mom again, I was gonna kill him. So as he was getting up off the floor, he told my mother either she goes or all y'all going. So my mom called Kalamazoo and off to Michigan I went. I stayed there about a month, a month and a half and I told the only dad I knew I wanted to come back to Chicago for my mama's birthday. <coughs> he gave me bus fare and I came and I stayed with my boyfriend's family until I got pregnant and then his grandmother kicked me out. By this time, my mother's husband had put her out and my younger brother, so we got an apartment together. I had my son when I was 18 and I moved out. My mother and brother moved in the same building I moved in. She was steady drinking like a fish and he was doing all kinds of things. He was a teenager, he was buck wild. So I took the GED. I was on public aid with my son I wanted to get a job because the aid wasn't giving me enough money. I didn't think so. I went to a temporary agency and started working for Blue Cross Blue Shield with my alias social security number and my alias name, Lynn Allen. I worked there for 15 years, but in the 12th year, I decided I needed a part-time job to help me with the expenses, helping mama out and, and my brother out. And so I got a part-time job as a barmaid. Now I was already doing cocaine, a toot here and a toot there. But at the bar, it just become overwhelming. I saw tooting cocaine every day, working, staying up to four o'clock, and had to be at work Monday morning to seven o'clock. It just overwhelmed me, and drugs just took me over. Finally, got fired from my good job under an alias name, Blue Cross, and I, um, I lost my apartment, I lost my car, I lost my cat. I was on the streets doing what I had to do to survive. I was selling drugs and selling my body and stealing and dodging the police. This went on for a while. My son had joined the Marine Corps during this time before I lost the job, okay. He came home, he was doing really well. He had a nice car, a nice apartment. He would look for me and try and help me and I'd tell him, just leave me alone, you know, just get away from me, leave me alone. I hadn't hop in the car with whoever was driving by. Well, one day, I was at a gas station on the east side and someone called my name and I turned around, it was my son. He asked me if I needed a ride, I told him sure. I got in the back seat of the car, he had a girl in the front seat. He introduced me as his friend. So he dropped the girl off and I got in the front seat and he turned to me with tears in his eyes and said, Ma, I introduce you as my friend because I tell all my friends and co-workers that my mom is dead. So I told him, don't feel bad, baby, because your mama is dead. I don't know who this person is when I look in the mirror. Well, he took me to his apartment, and I stayed there three days. No drugs for three days. He came home drunk one night. 
He just got paid, pocket full of money. He had a crown raw bag with cross quarters in it to do his laundry. I picked his pocket, I took his crown raw bag, and I took the keys off his key ring, and I left. A couple of days later, I called him and told him where his car was. He got his car, and he stopped looking for me then. He was done with me. In 2004, I had a friend. I would take drugs to her, and you know, then I'd leave. Well, that same night, I hooked up with a guy transacting business in a vacant lot in an old rundown church, and he commenced to beating on me and called me all kind of names. So I called on God. I said, what's going on? I'm not the worst, but I'm not the best. I called on God again, and the man just looked at me real crazy. I told me, I'm sorry, you're not the one. And he turned and ran from me. I was like, wow, I was lucky. I went on doing what I did. I hit a lick and came up, continued to do. The next month in January, I did the same thing with my friend. I went by there. Her kids ran up to me and asked me where was their mama. They hadn't seen her in two days. So I went to her apartment. I asked a guy. He was sitting there drunk. Well, what's going on? He handed me the newspaper. They found her body in the same vacant lap. The man had me in. She was dead and cut up. So I knew God hurt me. So I said, okay, Lord. <laughs> I, I know it's time for me to change my life. But I'm going to go one more round. So I hopped in the car with a retired cop, told him all what had happened, went to his place, got high, I did what we did, and I told him I had a friend in Harvey that had a shelter for, for homeless men. So he took me there. He dropped me off and said, Lynn, I don't want to see you on cottage no more. That was around January the 5th or 6th of 2000. 2005. My interview was January 23rd, 2005. I came to Tabitha House and I didn't, I didn't go back. Same day they admitted me, I moved in. I knew God had heard me. I knew he saved me. So I just surrendered all. That Tabitha House, everybody was so nice and kind and charming, but I was on guard waiting for the other shoe to drop. It never did. And an important part of Tabitha House as being a part of Spirit of God Fellowship. And here at church, I got to see how real families interacted, mothers and daughters and sons and dads, and, and I wanted that for me and my son. So I called him and I told him, I'm at Tabitha House, it's a treatment center. Yeah, right, whose house is that? Mom, I'm so sick of you, you always at somebody's house. And he hung up. He was still mad about his money in his car, I understood it. So I continued to call him. So finally he came with my grandson one Wednesday night, and he was amazed. <laughs> he saw it. I was amazed. I was a different person. He said, wow, you know, you need to stay here. I finally got my mama back, and he hugged me and kissed me. And I knew I was on the right track. He said, don't never leave that place, mama. <sighs> okay, during this process, God, after that, he restored my relationship with my family. I got a job at Providence Rehabilitation a nursing home. One of the graduates at Tabitha House had told the boss about me, so when I came for the interview, he said, it's just a formality, the job is already yours. That was on a Friday, I started that Monday. I had a new boss here, that was his last official duty, he was hiring me. So my new boss was asking me all the time, don't you want to be a cook? And I would tell her no, it was 150 people and I didn't want to have the responsibility. So my house church told me, if she asked you again, it's a guy, so he's telling her, yeah, you would do it. So she did and I did. I started cooking, I got my sanitation license. I cooked there for 11 and a half years. They promoted me to top to head cook. I love my job. The guy had got me and my brother and my mother, we were all together, it was a good thing. I was still at the top of the house working and able to save money. My mother was staying in Vegas. She had moved there to where her sister and her brother-in-law was and both of them had died. So she was ready to come back. So this was my time to be a good daughter, like I saw at church, and help my mama. I got her an apartment at a senior citizen building in Calumet City, and she loved it. She came back here. We had a relationship you wouldn't believe. We did everything together. We'd go to grocery shopping, which I hate. We'd go to the movies, we'd go out to eat. But it was all good. If I bought a blouse, she'd buy one but a different color. If I bought a wig, she'd get one with a little gray in it. We had a good relationship. In 2014, my oldest brother, Earl, died. He went to sleep. And he died, okay. Now my mother had been sick for a while, but I didn't know how serious her sickness was. And she kept telling my son she gonna get better. In 2015, I told her you gotta tell him the truth. We were at South Suburban Hospital, my son, my grandson, and my youngest brother was there, and she told my 
So she was going in the hospital. She was ready to go home. So he broke down. It was really emotional. I wasn't worth no sense. So I just hugged and kissed them all, and I went home. The next night, I went to house church, and my phone rang. And it was my grandson telling me the cops were at the house. I put Ron Swagger on the phone because I couldn't deal with it. My son was dead. He had went out after he left the hospital and did drugs and alcohol, and, and he died. He went to sleep and didn't wake up. I couldn't understand it. I was saying, Lord, why me? Why me? What's really going on? But I told the swaggers, I'm going to praise God anyway, just like Job did. There's a reason I don't even have to know what it is. In March, my mother died. She finally died. She was ready to go. I was grieving and grieving and grieving. I was off work. I was, I was miserable. I didn't understand nothing. My whole body, everything changed. So I decided to get my hip replaced because my hip was jacked up. I took some time off work, got a hip replacement, and I was going to retire in July. I went back to work in February, and it was like a different job. It was like, it was like, and then I was really emotional. I, it was, it wasn't cool at all. So one day I told my boss, I'm, I'm not well, I'm going home, and I ended up at the Social Security office applying for my retirement. Okay. <sighs> I told Jeanette and everybody I retired. It was like, oh, good, glad. I hadn't been coming to church, so I came to church that Sunday. On my way home, Jeanette called and said, do you know anybody who want to be the night manager at Tabitha House? And I said, you know the same people I know? No, I don't think so. <laughs> then I hung up the phone and I said, God, if this is your plan for me, then you got to make it real clear so that I'll know. The next day, I was coming from Waltz. I put in for an application for a part-time cashier. I just got home. Jeanette called me again, and she said, would you like to be? And I said, Jeanette, I don't know. She said, well, pray about it. So I called some Tabitha House graduates and family members, and we prayed. And my head was just going zoom, zoom, zoom. Everybody was coming at me, you know. And I was like, OK, OK. I wasn't leaning on my own understanding. I didn't know what I had to offer Tabitha House. I was like, you know, jacked up. But I called Jeanette and I told her, okay, when do you want me? She said, on the 25th. My landlady went along with it, everything was smooth. So I said, okay. And I came back to the house. And I was like, I was drowning in grief and I had nothing to do. I had nowhere to go. I had no plan, no purpose. I had nothing. But then God brought me back to the house and the ladies greeted me. And I was like, okay. And then I think back on what my son said. I got my real mom back. And you don't never need to leave that place. So I'm here to stay. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, that's what grace is. That's what grace is. Grace is not about us. It's all about God, right? We just saw it. But so many of us just can't believe that God's grace is a gift. We can't comprehend it. We say, how could a God in heaven want us to be his child, right? How could a God in heaven pay our debt in full? That's great. It's unbelievable, right? It's unbelievable. Speaking of unbelievable, here's an unbelievable story. It's about armadillos. Armadillos are nasty animals. Armadillos are opossums with a shell on them. And I don't like opossums either. I shouldn't be saying this in church, but all armadillos need to die. Armadillos are from the south, that's where you find them. So if you're going south on spring break or whatever and you see an armadillo on, a, uh, on the road, just run over the sucker and be done with it. <laughs> In Georgia, they cause so many problems that the law enforcement people say, if you see them, kill them. It's true. And so one day, this guy's in his house, his front porch, he sees an armadillo about 100 yards away. He gets his 9mm Glock out and he shoots a few bullets at the armadillo. He kills the armadillo. But one of those shots ricochets off the armadillo's shell, off of a fence, into the front door, 100 yards away now, into the back of a recliner where his mother-in-law is sitting in the chair. Shoots her in the back. She's fine. 
Just a flesh wound. But when you hear a story like that, it's unbelievable, right? It may not be true, but I just thought I'd share it with you. <laughs> but that's what grace is. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable that a God in heaven would send his only son to die on a cross for us and pay our debts in full so that we can live in eternity in heaven. That's grace. It's unbelievable, right? Are you with me this morning? And this is why we need to talk about grace. There's a great story in the Bible. You all know it. It's probably one of your favorite stories, one of mine, the prodigal son. The prodigal son. Now, before we, we, we talk about how grace applies to the prodigal son, we, we need to define what prodigal means. Because when I think of prodigal in the context of the prodigal son, I think, well, prodigal would mean bad or wild or crazy or whatever. That's not what prodigal means. Prodigal is defined as, listen to this, extremely wasteful. That's what prodigal means. So the story of the prodigal son is not necessarily about how he acted or what he did. It's what he wasted. And that's our story, too. We waste the grace of God. We waste the fact that he loves us. And, and when we don't live in his grace and when we don't believe in the grace of God that's freely given to us, we are wasting his love and we are wasting his grace, just like the prodigal son. And when Jesus was on earth, Jesus hung out with sinners. You know that. He hung out with the prostitutes. He hung out with the tax collectors. He hung out with those that didn't know God. He hung out with those that ran from God. And by the way, he was criticized back then. And that's why he tells this story. The audience that he was teaching, the audience that he was talking to knew about Jesus, knew who he hung out with. And that's why he told this story. He wanted us to understand, listen to me, that we can never be bad enough to not deserve his grace. That's grace. Jesus said, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Listen, I hope you agree with me. If you don't agree with me, you don't belong here. We're all sick. We all need the grace of God. Can I get an amen to that? And so if you have your Bibles this morning, I won't be long with this, but turn to, to Luke 15. If you don't have your Bibles, it's okay, we're going to... Put it up on the screen. Luke 15, we're going to talk about this prodigal story briefly. And I'm going to read from, from Luke, 11, uh, Luke 15, verses 11 and 12. And it goes like this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his son. So in Middle Eastern culture, fathers could give their inheritance at any time. That's the culture of who was listening to Jesus. Anytime they could give, the father could give his inheritance. Or after he died is when the inheritance would be transferred. And here comes this prodigal kid saying to his dad, I want my inheritance now. I want it now. There couldn't have been a bigger insult that this kid could have given to his father. He's saying to his dad, I don't want to wait until you die to get my inheritance. In other words, I'm going to live as though you are dead. Huh. How are we like this kid? Well, we live the way we want to, some of us. We take our inheritance now. We say we're going to waste it. We insult our fathers, our father in heaven, rather, just like the prodigal. We say, I, I, I know you're God. I know that, that, that you're up there. I believe in you. I, 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 uh, I want to go to heaven, but don't tell me how to live, some of us. Don't tell me how to manage my money. Oh, don't tell me that. Don't tell me how to treat 
those around me. And we run away from our Father. We run away from his grace and we waste our inheritance just like the prodigal, some of us. Second way that we're like the prodigal son. Verse 13. A few days later, his younger son packed all his belongings, moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. Wasted it. He had no morals. No morals. Insulted his dad, wasted the, the, the inheritance, and, and, and lived on his own. Well, there's this kindergartner, kindergarten teacher who was really sick, and for two weeks she couldn't teach the class, and so they had a substitute come in, and the substitute wasn't a really good teacher, and her way of teaching was to read stories. So she would read stories every day to the kindergarten class. And at the end of every story, that's kind of the way she taught, and at the end of every story she would say, kids, the moral of the story is, the moral of the story is. Well, this is kind of cool to the kids for a while, but after a while it, it, it got kind of old, and, and then finally the, uh, the, the, the regular teacher came back, and and uh, uh, immediately a student comes up and says, we like you better than the substitute teacher. And the teacher says, well, I, I'm flattered, but I, I don't understand. Why do you like me better? And the student immediately said to her, well, it's because you don't have any morals. <laughs> well, the prodigal didn't have any morals. Imagine this father, this prodigal father. He spent a lifetime working for the money. And then the prodigal son takes the money and wastes it. Imagine how that father must have felt. He worked all his life. He saved up. He gives the inheritance to his son, and he, son goes, his son goes out and wastes it. It's like the prodigal son is saying, hey, I want what's best for me. Are, are you seeing maybe yourself in this? I, I, I don't care what you taught me. I don't care how you raised me. I don't care what the Bible says. I know what God wants for me. I know the calling on my life, but I'm going to live life my way. I'm going to live like you're dead. And he wasted his inheritance. Some of us are like that now and then. We're just like the prodigal. Last thing. I love this. Verse 14 and 16. The last way we're like the prodigal. About the time his money ran out, verse 14, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the field to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Oh, man, I love this. He fed the pigs. Check this out. Prodigal and his family were Jewish, right? And this kid's feeding pigs. Do you get it? Pigs are not kosher. Pigs are unclean to the Jews. And here this kid is run so far from the grace of God that he's feeding pigs. There is nothing lower for a Jewish kid to be doing at this point in his life than feeding something that is unclean to him. Well, what does that have to do with us? What does pig feeding have to do with us? Well, if you run away from God, you are going to end up in the last place that you would ever expect. Are you feeling me this morning? Some of us are going to run from God and his grace, and we're going to end up in a place we never thought we would be. We're going to do things that we never thought we would ever, ever do. We're going to go places that we never thought we would go because we've wasted his grace. And we wake up one morning, we say, my God, I'm feeding pigs. What am I doing here? Some of you know what I'm talking about. We're just like the prodigal. But we learned some interesting things about God, our father, and the prodigal father. Dan, you want to bring the team up? First thing is this. God allows us to leave. These are important things. I want you to grab these on this first message on grace. God always allows us to leave. 
the prodigal father allowed his son to leave. Now, again, this shocked the people that were listening to Jesus' story that day. Because in that culture, fathers would never leave, let their children leave, especially in these circumstances. But that prodigal father let his son leave. How many of you know that our father lets us leave sometimes, doesn't he? He will let you feed pigs for a while. He will let you go out, forgive me, and screw up your life sometimes. Second thing that we learn about God in this story is that he won't shield you from the pain. That's a tough one. You experience sometimes, we experience sometimes a season of pig feeding. I'd, I'd ask for a show of hands, but we won't go there. How many of us have fed some pigs? I'll raise mine. Yeah. We experience seasons of pig feeding. We suffer real pain because of bad choices that we make. And our Father lets it happen. Wow. Why? Well, if we didn't experience these things sometimes in our life, Hear me, we would never turn around and come home. And that's the third thing that we learn about our Father. When we turn around, He always welcomes us home, amen? Always. And He embraces us. And he kisses us. And he throws us a party. And here's the best part. He never mentions our sins again. That's grace. Are you here this morning and you've run from God? Maybe you feel like your life is falling apart. Well, guess what? Maybe it's time that you turn around. And by the way, turn around means repent, change. That's a message for another day. But basically for this morning, are you here this morning and you've run? Maybe you need to turn around and come home. Maybe you've lived like you wished God were dead. I know that's hard to say. Maybe you've You've selfishly wasted his grace. Maybe you've experienced or are experiencing a season of pig feeding right now. Maybe you're tired of feeding those pigs and, and you're tired of having the pain that you experience when you live outside of the grace of God. Listen, friends, all you need to do is turn around. Maybe this morning's a good day to do it and come on home. He will always welcome you home. That's the heart of God that's what grace is. Amen? So as I close this morning, I want to read to you a story. It's a modern-day story of the prodigal, brilliantly written by a guy named Philip Clancy in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace? A young girl grows up in a cherry orchard just above Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents have been old-fashioned. They overreact all the time to her nose ring, her music, the, the length of her skirts. They ground her a few times, and she just gets madder. I hate you, she screams at her father. When he knocks on the door of her room after an argument, and that night she acts on a plan that she has rehearsed scores of times, and she runs away. Now, she's visited Detroit once before. It was on a bus trip with her church group. They watched the Detroit Tigers play. But because of the newspaper reports in Traverse City about the lurid details of gangs and drugs and violence in downtown Detroit, she concludes that it's the last place for her parents to look for her. So she goes to Detroit and her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride. He buys her lunch. He arranges a place for her to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all along, she decides. Her parents were keeping her from all the fun. 
The good life continues for a month, two months, a year. The man with a big car, she calls him boss, teaches her a few things. Since she's underage, men pay a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse, orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally, she thinks about the folks back home, but their lives now seem so boring. She can hardly believe she grew up back there in Traverse City. She has a brief scare when she sees her picture printed on the back of a milk carton with a headline, have you seen this child? But by now, she has blonde hair and a lot of makeup and body piercing, and nobody would recognize her. After a year, she, the first sign of illness appears. It amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. But before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She still turns a couple of tricks at night, but they don't pay much. All the money goes to support her habit. And when the winter blows in, she finds herself sleeping on the metal grates outside a big department store. A teenage girl at night in downtown Detroit can never relax. There's dark bands under her eyes. Her cough worsens. And one night as she lie awake listening to footsteps, all of a sudden everything about her life looked different. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl lost in a cold and frightening city. She begins to whimper. Her pockets are empty. She's hungry. She needs a fix. She pulls her legs tight beneath her and shivers under the newspaper that she's pulled atop her coat. And something jolts a memory and a single image fills her mind. May in Traverse City, where a million cherry trees bloom all at once. God, why did I leave, she says to herself. Pain stabs at her heart. My dog back home eats better than I do. She's sobbing. She knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she wants to go home. It's the cry of the human heart to always want to come home. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up without leaving a message the first two times. But the third time, she decides she might as well. She says, Dad, Mom, it's me. I'm wondering about coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way, and I'll be there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus and, and go until it hits Canada. It takes about seven hours for the bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City, and during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan. What if her parents are out of town and miss the message? Should she have waited another day until she could go talk to them? Even if they are home, they probably thought she was dead long ago. She should have given them some time to overcome the shock. Her thoughts bounce back and forth between those worries and the speech that she's prepared for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She says the words over and over in her mind, her throat tightening even as she rehearses them. She hasn't apologized to anyone in a long time. And when the bus finally rolls into the station, the driver announced in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, folks, that's all we've got. She checks herself in the mirror. She smooths her hair. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect. <laughs> not one of a thousand scenes that have played out in her mind, prepare her for what she sees. There in the bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of about 40 brothers, sisters, aunts, great aunts, uncles, cousins, a grandmother, and a great grandmother to boot. And they're all wearing goofy party hats. They're blowing noisemakers taped across the entire wall of the bus terminal is a banner that reads, Welcome Home. Out of the crowd of well-wishers breaks her dad. She stares, tears quivering in her eyes. She begins her memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry. He, interrupt, he interrupts her. He says, Hush, child. I've got no time for that. 
No time for apologies. You'll be late for the party. A banquet is waiting for you at home. That's grace. The, this church will always be about prodigals. Amen? That's our mission. We're a church full of people that are on our way home. And I want to say it loud and proud. All sinners are welcome here. There's an old evangelist. His name is C.T. Studd. It's a great name. And he said this. Some wish to live within the sound of the chapel bell. But I... I want to run a mission. A yard from the gates of hell. That's what I want to be a part of, friends. I hope you'll join me. You're a prodigal here this morning. And you've wasted his grace. It's okay. You can turn. You can come home. He's right here. He embraces you. He forgives you. He loves you. He kisses you. That's grace. Team's going to sing a song. Lauren's going to sing a beautiful song. And as this song is being sung, maybe you want to just slip out of your chair and come here to the altar and just, just experience his grace. Maybe it's for the first time. Maybe it's for the thousandth time. Maybe, maybe, maybe you just need to just, just, just have his arms around you as this song is being sung. And if you need to slip out, just join us here at the front and let his grace, his amazing grace, fill you this morning.